Good morning, participants. In some parts of Europe, already good afternoon and warmly welcome to our webinar today to discuss a very important and serious human rights issue, measures against the trading goods used for death penalty, torture and other cruel, inhuman or degrading treatment or punishment. Today, we will particularly look at the newly adopted Council of Europe recommendation on this topic and the measures identified by the Committee of Ministers against this kind of trade. This webinar aims at raising awareness of this recommendation and seek, together with our high-level speakers, expert panelists and all participants today, ways and means to implement it effectively at the domestic level. This webinar is co-organized by the German Presidency of the Committee of Ministers of the Council of Europe, the Council of Europe Steering Committee for Human Rights, CDDH, Amnesty International and the Omega Research Foundation. Translation is provided in English and French. My name is Krista Oinonen and I will moderate our discussions during this first part of the online event today. At the beginning of the webinar, we will hear three high-level speakers and then we will take a closer look at the recommendation with four experts. Now, I am pleased to welcome Ms. Berber Kofler, Commissioner for Human Rights Policy and Humanitarian Assistance, Federal Ministry for Foreign Affairs of Germany, and also the current Chair of the Committee of Ministers of the Council of Europe for her opening remarks. Madam, please. Good morning, everybody. Dear Secretary General Pejinovic Buric, dear High Commissioner Bachelet, dear Secretary General Kalima, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the German Presidency of Committee of Ministers, I would like to warmly welcome you to this online conference. Dealing with measures against the trade in goods used for the death penalty and torture, this event addresses some of the Council of Europe's core values and commitments. As member states of the Council of Europe, we are committed not to apply the death penalty. It's a condition for membership. Nationally, Germany made a clear decision after the Second World War to remove death penalty from its legislation. This is now enshrined in our constitution. Capital punishment is a cruel and inhumane form of punishment under all circumstances. The state should not be able to kill it all. There are practical concerns as well. The risk of miscarriage of justice has been proven as has the death penalty's lack of deterrent effect. Countries that still impose the death penalty should at least suspend their executions as a first step. Globally, we can see a growing trend against the death penalty. Last autumn, 123 states voted in favor for, of the resolution on moratorium on the use of death penalty in the UN General Assembly. Beyond capital punishment, torture is one of the worst violations of human rights. Therefore, banning tortures appears prominently in the European Convention of Human Rights as its Article 3. The ban on torture is absolute under the international humanitarian law and international human rights law. The Convention Against Torture and other cruel, inhumane or degrading treatment or punishment has nearly universal, ratif has nearly universal ratification with 171 state parties. We are, uh, we are now working on full and proper implementation and towards reflecting this in other areas like trade. The fight against torture is a cornerstone of the German human rights policy. The guarantee of these fundamental rights to all citizens of this Council of Europe's 47 member states firmly belongs to our common human rights, a key in the widest European areas. At the current presidency, Germany has put the protection of human rights high on the agenda. Traditionally, this has been at the core of the Council of Europe's mandate. Therefore, we strongly welcome the adoption of the Committee of Ministers' Recommendation 2021-2, which addresses measures against the trade in goods used for the death penalty, torture, and other cruel and inhumane or degrading treatment or punishment. 
We are seeking to highlight this achievement at the forthcoming ministerial session in Hamburg on Friday this week. The role model for the recommendation is the EU anti-torture regulation. Adopted in 2005, this regulation reflects our strong commitment to human rights and comprehensive approach to abolish torture and capital punishment. Neil van Boven, the former UN Special Rapporteur on Torture, called the EU anti-torture regulation a milestone in the fight against torture and a model that could be followed by other countries. Trade in goods that do not serve any purpose other than capital punishment or torture is prohibited in principle by this regulation. Furthermore, the trading goods that have a legitimate purpose but can be abused for capital punishment or torture is subject to licensing requirements. We do still see unfortunate cases of companies trying to get around certain regulations, so implementation of the recommendation is crucial. It is important to keep the right balance between preventing abuse of these goods for human rights violations and not preventing legitimate trade in them in particular medical products that are subject to the anti-torture regulation can also serve to protect human lives through their legitimate use. Licensing decisions must therefore be made on a case-by-case -case basis and consider all relevant information. In addition, the EU anti-torture regulation also addresses trade in goods for the purpose of riot control. The regulation is, is thus based on comprehensive approach to the protection of human rights. The German federal uh, government is committed to ensuring that remaining control gaps are also closed at the international level. The Council of Europe's recommendation is therefore an important step along this path. This shows how the EU and the Council of Europe can work hand in hand to achieve their common goals. On behalf of the German Presidency at the Council of Europe, I thank you all and wish you a very fruitful debate. Thank you and have a nice and a fruitful debate today. Thank you. Thank you, Madam. I also take this opportunity to thank Germany for a substantive, very eventful presidency during the past six months. The new recommendation reflects the Council of Europe's unwavering commitment to the abolition of the death penalty and the obligation of its 47 member states, all parties to the European Convention on Human Rights, to prohibit torture and inhuman or degrading treatment or punishment. We are delighted that the Council of Europe's Secretary General, Ms. Pejinovic Buric, will address the webinar through a video message. The European Convention on Human Rights bans the death penalty. It prohibits torture and other cruel inhuman treatment or punishment. And for every one of the Council of Europe's 47 member states, its word is law. But our unwavering commitment to ending executions in Europe is not enough. We must also stop any European involvement in enabling them anywhere in the world. It was the Council of Europe's Parliamentary Assembly that took the important first step of making a recommendation in this area and of calling for guidance on establishing an effective regulatory regime. The result is the recommendation adopted by our member states in March and which you will discuss today. It is intended to encourage and assist all national authorities in reviewing their legislation and practice on the trade of goods that are inherently abusive or can be misused in that way. And it owes its strength to those who cooperated in its development, the governments and experts represented on our steering committee for human rights and civil society through Amnesty International and the Omega Research Foundation who have also co-organized this webinar with the German authorities. Today we have an opportunity to go a few important steps further to promote the uh, implementation of the recommendation and to make it widely known. We want to share the international standard setting model we have with 
other international bodies and other countries outside of Europe. It is first for governments of all member states of the Council of Europe to implement the recommendation. But we want our experience to be useful to others as well. That's why I'm particularly happy that the European Union, the United Nations and the members of the Alliance for Torture-Free torture -free Trade should also be attending the webinar. Let me extend to all my best wishes for a successful event. We thank the Secretary General for these opening remarks. For, than, uh, for more than 50 years, Amnesty International has been documenting torture, exposing the perpetrators and helping victims get justice. Amnesty International has also supported the drafting of this recommendation. Now I am pleased to welcome the Secretary General of Amnesty International, Ms. Agnes Kalamart, and she will also present a video from Amnesty International. Madam, the floor is yours. Mrs. Kalama, you have to request for the floor if you want to be able to speak. Yeah, perfect. Your microphone is off. Thank you very much. Uh, sorry for the technical issue. It is my honor to join you this morning. I wish to thank the German presidency and the co-organizers for bringing us together for this uh, purpose. The trade in the tools for torture is a trade to inflict fears and terror and silence people into submission. For the torture that trade enables, for the cruelty it accessorized, and for the equipment of pain and suffering that it provides, it simply must be eradicated and controlled. There is no other end for this discussion today than that the torture trade end. And this is what the Council of Europe recommendations are doing. They call for a trade ban on inherently abusive law enforcement equipment. They call for stringent trade controls on standard law enforcement equipment that can be readily misused to inflict torture or other ill treatment. And they propose a ban on equipment designed to carry out the death penalty. For over 20 years, Amnesty International, partnering with the Omega Research Foundation, has researched the issue of trading goods used to perpetrate torture and carry out the death penalty. Some of our key findings are in this video, which we are going to show you now. Can I call for the video, please?
Mrs. Kalama, can you ask for the floor again? Your microphone is off. Perfect. Amnesty and Omega have documented harrowing cases of torture and ill treatment across the world while tracking thousands of executions. Many of those practices, abhorrent as they are, are facilitated by specific equipment, which is bought and sold around the world. Some of that equipment, and these are the ones that, uh, that is banned, is inherently abusive, such as leg iron and so on. Other equipment, such as chemical irritant, may have a legitimate role in law enforcement, but is liable to be abused. Let me take a few minutes to speak about what has become a frequent feature of our news program. Uh, we have seen a, a range of protests even over the last week in Colombia, Israel, Myanmar. We have seen and witnessed, in fact, protesters tear gas, coughing, collapsing, videos of police officers paper spraying in the face at a very short distance. We have seen instances in our TV screens of people, of police officers using those tools to inflict pain. Um, these so-called less lethal weapons have wrecked suffering. They have maimed, blinded, created lasting chronical uh, suffering, leading to permanent disability. They have also killed frequently. And what to say of the tools for the implementation of uh, death penalty, all of which have been found by experts to amount to torture or inhuman and degrading treatment. There is no death penalty carried out right now, which does not inflict uh, pain and suffering to such an extent that it amounts to torture or inhuman and degrading treatments. Pharmaceutical chemicals yeah. have played an increasingly prominent role in the death penalty, and they require very strict control. We at Amnesty International, with our uh, colleagues at Omega, have supported and contributed to the creation of binding regulations across the European Union, which have been strengthened over years. We continue to monitor their implementation. And unfortunately, our delegates find and report evidence of spike shields and other being promoted and displayed at trade fair held in EU member states, such as Paris recently. That must lead to its removal after we have denounced it. So we very much welcome the Council of Europe's pioneering role in the prohibition of torture and other in treatment, the abolition of the death penalty, and it can now play a vital role in effectively supporting the prohibition of inherently abusive equipment and control of equipment liable to be misused for torture and uh, other ill treatment. We do hope to see a strong commitment to take the necessary steps, including national law and policy reforms and establishment of system of information yeah. sharing and reporting across the Council of Europe member states. The collaboration and exchange that this forum provides between civil society, member state, international organization is essential. We have the capacities to act decisively together that otherwise escape us if we are disconnected or disjointed. The work of the Council of Europe in taking decisive action to combat trade in torture tool is commendable and sets up an example that we call on other actors in the international community to match. The test, of course, now lies with the responsibilities and actions of the 47 Council of Europe member states. We call on each one to now implement the recommendations swiftly and comprehensively in order to make its promise real, in order that all states visibly and in practice end the trade in pain and suffering. We also call on all member states of the UN to come together to forge an international legally binding instrument 
to combat the trade in torture and death penalty equipment. We urge the Council of Europe and its member states to be at the forefront of this push, to use their leadership to support, promote and strengthen this called for UN process. It must be a worldwide push. Over the last five years, Amnesty International has reported on torture and other ill treatment in over 140 countries, a likely underestimate given the secretive nature of this abuse. We have reported on the misuse of the so-called less lethal weapons in every protest that we have monitored. The trade that is enabling, aiding, abating these abhorrent practice must end. The trade that is enabling the terrorizing, the silencing, the fears must end. Profiteering in torture must end. These are the duty of every state. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Kalamar. On behalf of the organizers, I would like to thank all the high level speakers. Their words lead us to the first panel discussion in which we will discuss the steps for the proper implementation of the recommendation in the Council of Europe member states and the role of the Council of Europe, its member states and civil society in this regard. The Committee of Ministers expressed its deep concern of the fact that certain equipment and goods whose only practical use is for torture can be produced, promoted or marketed in the Council of Europe member states, including at European trade fairs or on the websites of European companies and companies based in Europe. Now, let's take a closer look at the situation. I encourage all participants to use the webinar's chat uh, for comments and questions. Our first panelist, Mr. Michael Crawley, has worked for 30 years on arms control, security and human rights issues, most recently as a research associate at the Omega Research Foundation. He was appointed by the Council of Europe's Steering Committee for Human Rights as an expert consultant to facilitate drafting this recommendation. Michael will provide an overview of the types of tools of torture divided into inherently abusive equipment as well as law enforcement and restraints that can be misused for torture and other ill treatment. The online floor is yours, Michael. We cannot hear you, Michael, yet. If Michael is having this technical problem, so maybe we will continue with our seminar uh, uh, panelists and, and Michael, if, if you will try to solve this technical issue, so we will jump to our second panelist and we will come back to you soon. So while Michael is solving this technical issue, what happens? Uh, on, on, on online webinars, I'm really happy to present our next panelist, who is Mr. Nico Hirsch. Independent monitoring of treaty obligations is one of the cornerstones of the Council of Europe, and therefore I'm particularly pleased to introduce uh, Mr. Nico Hirsch, who is a member of the European Committee for the Prevention of Torture and Inhuman or Training Treatment or Punishment, CPT. He has a long career as a high-ranking police officer in Luxembourg. Uh, Nico will address the main standards of the CPT in this area, nature of misuse of law enforcement equipment and restraints within the Council of Europe. Please, Nico, if you request the floor, so I will provide it from here. Please. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. If you allow, I will uh, make my presentation in French. It's uh, more convenient for me. Uh, alors, je vous remercie d'abord. Well, first of all, thank you very much for thinking of the CPT, for inviting it to take part in this seminar, and to share its experience in this field. Its experience is quite long. It goes back over over 30 years. 
I would like to divide my presentation into two points. First of all, I'll be presenting the CPT to enable the participants better to understand its terms of reference. And in the second part of my presentation, I will be talking about the abusive use of restraints and law enforcement equipment. So the CPT is made up of 47 members, one member for each member state of the Council of Europe. And these members are neutral and independent, so they don't represent their country, the country on behalf of which they are there. The participants do not participate in the visits, the country visits of their own country, and do not comment on their own country. Members of the CPT have a term of office that runs for four years, renewable twice, from various backgrounds. There are lawyers, doctors, sociologists, psychologists, um, law enforcement professionals, academics, etc. The work of the CPT is prevented. It, um, it is exercised through periodic and ad hoc country visits. The periodic visits are are carried out in all states' party on a regular basis, every four to six years on average. The ad hoc visits are organized by the committee when circumstances require it. During a visit, the CPT enjoys extensive, extensive powers under the convention. It can have access to the territory of the state concerned. It has the right to move unrestricted on the territory of the state. It has access to any, any place of uh, deprivation of freedom and uh, the right to move around freely inside those places. Access to information about people detained and the places they're detained and any other information that the state may have any information that the CPT may require to carry out its mission. The committee can also talk with people deprived of liberty without witnesses, and the committee is able to contact any, anyone who is likely to provide it with useful information. There are two fundamental principles in the relation between the CPT and member states, cooperation and confidentiality. In this respect, it's worth underlining that the role of the committee is not to point the finger at the member states, but to help them in order to prevent ill treatment of people deprived of liberty. After each visit, the CPT drafts a report exposing the, the facts, the findings on the ground, and if necessary, recommendations as well as other advice on the basis of which uh, a dialogue begins with national authorities. So we are not judges, we make recommendations. The CPT, sorry, the, uh, the CPT's reports after each visit are confidential. However, on request of the governments, most of these reports are made public. Over 12 states have given their agreement to these reports being automatically published. After 471 visits carried out to this date, 275 periodic visits and 196 ad hoc visits, 454 reports have been drafted up to December 2020, and only 34 reports have not been made public. Of these 34 unpublished reports, only 20, 21 are on one member state. On top of physical ill treatment, there's also psychological abuse such as um, threats, racist behavior, insults, etc., that people deprived of liberty have reported in our confidential hearings with them. In order to trace these allegations, we insist that any use of force and special methods be documented in ad hoc registers and therefore be traceable. The application of the individual rights of anybody arrested, starting from their arrest, such as the right to a lawyer, right to inform their family, right to see a doctor, 
includes the, the right to have any injuries documented by medical certificate. Law enforcement operations are not part of the CPT's terms of reference. It's worth recalling that on top of the CPT there are other control mechanisms such as the national prevention mechanisms and the UN's SPT with whom we work closely. I'll now broach the second point of my presentation. The abusive use of restraint equipment and means. First of all, the use of violence. The CPT insists on the fact that once somebody is arrested, deprived of liberty, any use of force is to be prohibited. Um, punches, kicks, the use of truncheons, the use of pepper spray, etc. are inadmissible. Furthermore, the use of any violence or threat in order to force a confession during interrogation is strongly criticized by the CPT. Finally, the use of physical violence as a means of corporal punishment can be considered like an inhuman and degrading treatment. Unregulated objects. Allegations about the use of such equipment, which is not part of the official police equipment, have been confirmed either during inspection of police premises and vehicles or by medical examinations. Let me recall that during each visit we have doctors as part of our delegations. Here we're talking about the use of truncheons, baseball bats, uh, brass knuckles, electric cables and batteries, knives and uh, axes, cattle prods, electric truncheons, etc. During our inspections, the CPT has often found such items on police premises, so we really must insist on the fact that evidence, pieces of evidence, must be labelled, registered and kept in specific premises. They mustn't be left lying around in offices. The, as for the use of bags on a person's head or bandages over their eyes, Blindfolds, the CPT contests the use of these methods, which is sometimes used during transportation or interrogation, because it can generate psychological stress, disorient the person, and prevent them from identifying the police officers responsible. As for the use of firearms, we recall the European prison rules, which specify that unless it's a situation of emergency, operational emergency, um, prison staff should never carry lethal weapons on prison premises. Electric shock, shock weapons, often called tasers, um, these have been the object of an in-depth chapter of the 20th General Report of the CPT, the period running between 2009 and 2010. These weapons must not be part of the ordinary equipment of a police officer or of anybody working in direct contact, contact with detainees. A legal basis and detailed regulation must fix the conditions for the carrying and use of such weapons. Only police officers have been specifically trained and having had information about incompatible use for medical reasons, as well as the training in first aid, only such personnel should be authorized to use these weapons on the basis of necessity, subsidiarity, proportionality and prior warning. And only if other techniques such as negotiation and persuasion, as well as manual restraint techniques have failed or are not operational. Only a real and present danger to life or physical integrity may justify the use of such weapons. The new generations of these weapons have a registration system and the CPT has serious reservations about the direct use, the direct contact use of these weapons. Electrical batons and belts are to be prohibited. As for truncheons, 
In a prison environment, the visible wearing of truncheons and handcuffs can give an impression of physical weakness and does not contribute to a positive relationship between prison wardens and detainees. The open wearing of truncheons in waiting zones or in retention centres for aliens is not adequate. Regarding handcuffs, the CPT insists on the correct use of handcuffs. Handcuffs must not be too tight. The people arrested must not be handcuffed to fixed objects such as um, rings bolted to the wall, benches or beds. And an individual risk assessment should be carried out to determine the means of restraint such as body belts or foot shackles. The wearing of handcuffs and other means of restraint during a medical examination is not acceptable. In a prison environment, the systematic handcuffing of detainees when they are outside their cell is questionable, to say the least. Now, means of restraint and physical fixation. During recent visits to police units, the CPT had its attention called to the use of such methods and is going to give an opinion. Furthermore, the CPT recommends to set up secured rooms in hospitals and not to shackle detainees to their hospital beds. Restraint beds have no raison d'etre in a prison. Restraint and immobilization should be used only in a hospital environment under order of the doctors and under direct and continued surveillance and for the shortest time possible, followed by a debriefing with the person concerned. Finally, the CPD recommends suppressing cage beds or net beds in psychiatric units. Tear gas should never be part of the regulation equipment of prison wardens and the use of tear gas in enclosed spaces is prohibited or should be prohibited. This has been confirmed by the Court of Human Rights and I have a, a personal reservation on the use of pepper spray in confined spaces. A penultimate point is about prison vans. Here the CPT has drawn up a, a thematic fact sheet these vans must be equipped so as to respect basic security uh, measures in, in the event of an accident and a minimum amount of space per detainee. Finally, CCTV. The CPT is of the opinion that prison cells must not be systematically equipped with CCTV. Furthermore, it is worth pixelating some zones such as showers or toilet areas in order to guarantee a certain amount of privacy. A final point, allow me to underline that we must be aware of the fact that uh, law enforcement do a difficult job. They, knew, they need specific equipment in order to carry out their often dangerous tasks. And all of this in a context where they have to protect their own physical integrity but also uphold the, the principles of safeguarding human rights on the other hand. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Nicole, for bringing this independent CPT's monitoring perspective uh, to the panel. In this context, it must be acknowledged that the CPT has successfully carried out monitoring also during the COVID-19 restrictive measures, and this has been particularly important and valuable during these exceptional measures. So thank you. So now, let's check whether Michael is on board. Michael, the floor is yours. Thank you. I hope everybody can hear me now. Perfect. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, I'll just share my screen.
Okay. The Omega Research Foundation investigates the global manufacture, promotion, trade, and use of law enforcement equipment and weapons, in including those employed in serious human rights abuses, notably torture and other ill treatment. I'd like to give you an indication of the range of equipment of concern that Omega has discovered being actively promoted in the Council of Europe region. This includes European companies promoting their products to law enforcement or correctional communities in their own countries, elsewhere in Europe, and outside the region. And conversely, I will cite examples of foreign companies promoting their products in Europe. A range of inherently abusive electroshock devices are designed for attachment directly to prisoners' bodies and can be activated by remote control. They include stun belts, stun vests, and stun cuffs. They are worn sometimes for many hours at a time with the constant threat that they can be triggered at any moment. Whilst these devices currently appear to be manufactured by companies in the Americas, Africa, and Asia, certain European companies have previously promoted electric shock handcuffs, as well as electric shock belts that can deliver 50,000 volts to a prisoner's kidneys. Similarly, non-European companies have promoted such goods in European trade names. Their manufacture, trade, and use should be prohibited. A wide range of direct contact electric shock weapons and devices have been developed and marketed by companies in all world regions, specifically for law enforcement. Omega has identified companies in at least 14 COE member states that manufactured or marketed such weapons, including shock patterns, gun guns, shock shields. And new products are coming onto the market all the time, such as electric shock gloves promoted by companies in the Americas, Asia, and Europe, as pictured here, and electric shock grabbing devices manufactured by companies in Asia, are pictured here being promoted in the European arms fair. Their manufacture, trade, and use by law enforcement officials should be prohibited. Projectile electric shock weapons fire darts connected by electrical wires to the launch device, which attach to a person's body or clothing, delivering an incapacitating high voltage shock that causes the subject to lose muscle control. Such weapons, which are promoted by companies in all world regions, including Europe, as pictured here, have a potentially legitimate law enforcement purpose, but only in very limited standoff situations where an officer is preventing an imminent threat of death or serious injury, and their trade needs to be strictly controlled. Omega has identified companies in at least 26 COE member states that manufactured or marketed mechanical restraints, i.e. handcuffs and leg restraints. If employed in conformity with international human rights standards, such devices can be legitimately used to ensure the safe arrest and restraint of prisoners. However, they can and are misused in prisons and by police throughout the world. And so their transfer to law enforcement agencies should be controlled. In contrast, we have identified a small number of European companies that manufactured or promoted inherently degrading or painful restraints which should be prohibited, including thumb cuffs, as pictured here, and restraints designed to be bolted prison walls, floors, and ceilings. Omega has identified companies in at least 26 COE member states that manufactured or marketed handheld kinetic impact weapons, police batons and truncheons, whilst companies in at least 20 member states manufactured or promoted kinetic impact projectiles 
such as plastic or rubber bullets and associated launches. These weapons are widely employed by law enforcement officials in public order policing, as well as in places of detention. While they may be, have a legitimate law enforcement role, human rights organizations regularly do documented their misuse to inflict unnecessary or excessive force which has amounted in certain cases to torture or other ill treatment, or has resulted in serious injury or death. Consequently, the trade in all such weapons needs to be strictly controlled. In addition, Omega has recovered the market for law enforcement agencies of a range of inherently abusive or dangerous kinetic impact weapons and devices designed to increase, not minimize, the pain and injury inflicted on subjects. They include spiked batteries, spiked or serrated shields, spiked arm armor. Although manufactured by Asian companies, we have found them being promoted at a number of European arms players. They clearly cannot be used for any legitimate law enforcement purposes, and their manufacture, trade, and use must be prohibited. Chemical irritants, such as tear gas and pepper spray, are commonly used around the world for law enforcement purposes, notably for dispersing crowds, as well as for facilitating arrest and restraint of individuals. However, they can be easily misused, including in prison cells and detention centers to ill-treat and torture individuals, and during policing of public assemblages, potentially to facilitate ill-treatment and punishment on a large scale. Whilst this is a global trade, Omega identified companies in at least 27 COE member states that have manufactured or promoted chemical irritants and associated delivery mechanisms, such as grenades, cartridges, handheld sprayers, and projectile launchers that disperse limited amounts of chemical irritant over relatively short distances. Globally, we have identified a growing range of systems capable of delivering far greater amounts of chemical irritants over wider areas or extended distances. These include, as pictured here, European multi barrel projectile launches and irritant dispersing drones. The trade in chemical irritants and associated delivery mechanisms needs to be controlled, with any delivery mechanisms deemed inherently inappropriate for law enforcement prohibited. Omega has identified a total of 94 relevant arms and law enforcement equipment, trade fairs, and exhibitions held in 15 COE member states between 2014 and 2018. Companies based in the COE region, as well as foreign companies, marketed their goods at such events, which were attended by the correctional and law enforcement communities from both COE member states and countries outside the region. During this period, at certain trade fairs, foreign companies actively promoted inherently abusive equipment and weapons, such as spiked metal batons, spiked shields, electric shock capture devices, electric shock ankle cuffs, metal interrogation chairs, weighted leg irons, and hoods connected to handcuffs that were marketed for use on arrested individuals. Clearly, it is vital that all arms law enforcement equipment trade fairs are stringently regulated to prevent the promotion of inherently abusive goods. And if discovered that such goods are immediately confiscated, the companies ejected and banned from future events. A number of European states, notably certain national police forces, as well as commercial companies based within COE member states, have provided technical assistance or training to law enforcement or correctional officials from other member states and third countries. Professional training of police and prison officials in the appropriate... Sorry. <clears throat> 
uh, professional training of police and prison officials in the appropriate use of legitimate law enforcement equipment can reinforce and operationalize human rights standards and good practices. However, human rights organizations have raised concerns that certain training risks inherently, uh, sorry, directly or indirectly facilitating torture or other ill treatments, and all such training needs to be stringently controlled. Furthermore, in certain cases, law enforcement officials appear to have been trained in potentially abusive or dangerous methods. Such training, particularly if endorsed by senior law enforcement officials in recipient countries, risks entrenching potentially abusive practices and should be prohibited. For example, one European company supplying security equipment also trains police forces in their use. This training has included employment of restraints to place prisoners in hyperextended positions, hog tying, and also in the use of batons for neck holds. Such techniques are similar to those the European Committee for the Prevention of Torture recommended be halted. Images and videos on the company's website show training in such techniques to a range of police forces in Europe, Asia, Africa, and the Americas. I want to conclude by acknowledging the significant advances that have been made by European states to bring this trade under control, notably through the introduction and subsequent strengthening of the EU anti-torture regulation and the recent adoption of the Council of Europe Committee of Ministers recommendation. To make a real difference, both instruments must be fully implemented by all relevant member states. For our part, OMEGA will continue our investigations, bringing to light activities of concern and seeking to engage constructively with all states to effectively address the trade as part of the global effort to prohibit and prevent torture. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Michael. After these highly disturbing images, I must ask you a question. How have states responded when you provided them with this evidence of activities of concern? And uh, what areas of this trade uh, do you believe in particular need to be addressed by, by states? If you can request the floor again for this question. Um. Well, um, the responses that um, we receive from from individual states and indeed companies uh, uh, to our research uh, and the evidence that we bring forward, it varies considerably. Um, a number of states and, and companies have responded with silence and will not address the evidence presented. But on other occasions, there's been real dialogue and, and progress made with states undertaking investigations or companies unilaterally halting all promotion of specific goods of concern that we've identified. Um, in recent years, for example, we've had uh, constructive discussions with both commercial companies and state officials organizing certain arms fairs to explore how they can introduce more effective pre-screening procedures and in-house monitoring of these events to ensure that all attending companies uh, do not promote inherently abusive goods, and if they are found to do so, that such materials are identified and removed speedily. The stalls are closed and the companies are subsequently banned from future events. And in addition, at, um, at a European level, we've actively engaged with the European Commission, highlighting company activities of concern or, or failures in certain state uh, national controls and have recommended how these can be addressed and also worked with the Commission and Member States uh, to uh, encourage uh, strengthening of the EU anti-torture regulation. And similarly, we, we've worked very constructively with the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe and then with the Human Rights Steering Committee, firstly to demonstrate the need for common European trade control standards and then to recommend what these should comprise. And, and we very much hope that, that we can now work with states to facilitate effective implementation of both the EU anti-torture regulation and um, the COE recommendation.
Thank you, Michael. And this is to all participants of this webinar. Please do remember use the message field. You can send comments and questions to our panelists uh, by uh, using this uh, chat on the right hand side of the CUDA system. Now, our third panelist is Ms. Nicola Wenzel, head of the Human Rights Office at the German Federal Ministry of Justice and Consumer Protection, and she is also the government agent before the European Court of Human Rights. She leads the ministry's business and human rights team and is the CDDH rapporteur on human rights and business. Nicola will look at the recommendations, recommendations for member states and next steps ahead for the Council of Europe. Please, Nicola. Thank you, Krista, for those kind words of introduction and good morning to everybody. The reason we are gathering today and also celebrating a little bit is, as you all know, that on the 31st of March, the Committee of Ministers adopted the Council of Europe recommendation on measures against the trade of goods used for the death penalty, torture, or other cruel, inhuman, inhuman or degrading treatment or punishment. My task today is to lay out the key obligations for Council of Europe member states resulting from the recommendation. Then we will look into the future together and explore what steps lie ahead for the Council of Europe. So what are the key obligations for member states? And before I explain them to you, I would uh, like to make a small caveat. I will use the term obligations, but please bear in mind that we are not talking about the binding instrument, but about a recommendation to member states. So we are in the area of soft law and we are not talking about obligations in the strict sense. Now, if we look at the title of our recommendation, Measures Against the Trade of Goods, we already get a pretty good idea about what kind of instrument the recommendation is. Because in fact, the recommendation is a trade instrument. It regulates trade. Because trade, commercial transactions between private individuals and companies can contribute to human rights violations. The idea behind the recommendation is that by regulating trade, we can prevent human rights violations. By limiting the availability of tools that are used for torture, we can combat torture. This approach determines the key obligations for member states. States are called upon to establish a trade control regime for the import, export, and transit of goods used for torture. The recommendation distinguishes three categories of goods, and they have been mentioned before, but I would like to briefly set them out for you. The first category of goods covered by the recommendation is inherently abusive equipment. And in those cases, it is clear by simply looking at the equipment that the only thing you can do with it is to use it to torture, torture or ill-treat people. An example that has been shown by Michael um, before are body-worn electric shock devices. So, for this first category of goods, inherently abusive equipment, the recommendation provides that trade with this kind of equipment shall be prohibited, plain and simple. That was the first category. The second category of equipment that is covered by the recommendation is so-called dual-use equipment. So, equipment that can be used for legitimate purposes but can be misused to torture and ill-treat people. 
An example also mentioned before are portable electric discharge weapons, which can be used for legitimate purposes, but can also be misused. With respect to this category of goods, states are called upon to control the trade through an authorization and licensing system. That works as follows. If a company wants to export such goods, it has to apply for a license and indicate the nature and volume of goods, the end user in the other state, and also the nature of the intended use. And if there are reasonable grounds to believe that the equipment and goods will be used to torture or inflict ill treatment, then the application has to be denied. So for the second category of goods, dual use goods, we have a licensing system foreseen in the recommendation. The third category of goods are certain pharmaceutical chemicals that are used in lethal injection executions. With respect to these uh, chemicals, the trade is also to be, to be controlled through a licensing system. So what about the goods or the specific goods covered by the recommendation? The recommendation contains detailed lists of goods falling into these three different categories. These lists are not exhaustive and they are indicatory. So member states are encouraged or called upon to establish their own lists at the national level and to regularly revise them. The lists contained in the recommendation itself will be reviewed when the implementation of the recommendation as a whole is examined not later than five years after the adoption of the recommendation, so in 2026. So what activities are covered exactly by the recommendation? I have already mentioned import, export, and transit. But the recommendation also covered, and this was mentioned by Michael before, technical assistance, training, brokering, advertisement, and promotion at trade fairs. And what activities are covered depends on the different categories. So the different categories of goods apply to specific activities. I will not go into the details here. To sum up, the key obligation for member states resulting from the recommendation is to set up a system to control the trade with the kind of goods covered by the recommendation. I would now like to take a moment to reflect on the implications of that system. Because even if the obligation to control is on states, what the recommendation does here is to affirm the responsibility of companies to take into account the human rights implications of their business activities and make sure that their activities do not harm. Those of you familiar with the business and human rights discourse know this concept. It is the corporate responsibility to respect human rights as laid down in the second pillar of the United Nations Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights. Now, why do I mention this? Because I think it is important to be aware of the connection with business and human rights discourse. The recommendation is an additional building block of the corporate responsibility to, to respect and thereby strengthens the business and human rights discourse. At the same time, making the connection helps us better achieve the aim of our Council of Europe recommendation. Because we can use the structures and networks that have been built in the last years in the business and human rights domain to raise awareness of the recommendation in the business community. Here, in fact, I am already addressing the second aspect of my intervention, the implementation of the recommendation. If you look at point four of the appendix to the recommendation, you will see that the Council of Europe platform for human rights and business 
shall be used to raise awareness in the business community. So here, the recommendation already clearly makes the link with the business and human rights discourse. For the reasons mentioned before, I consider this to be essential. That's why one of the most important steps ahead for the Council of Europe is to adapt the online human rights and business platform so as to be able to use it as an implementation tool for our recommendation. There is another important point concerning implementation I would like to make. The, consequence, the consequences that we need to draw from a most remarkable feature of the recommendation, its embeddedness in the international efforts in regulating trade in torture tools. The recommendation calls on member states to join the Alliance for Torture Free Trade and states that member states should promote action in relevant international fora and explicitly mentions the UN process. Now, I am sure that this topic will be addressed in more detail in the second panel today, but I wanted to at least briefly mention it in my intervention. This brings me to my last point on the steps ahead for the Council of Europe, and this point is a procedural one. Those of you that have been involved in the process leading to the adoption of the recommendation by the Committee of Ministers, know that the recommendation is the result of a close cooperation between the Council of Europe, the Member States, and civil society. Without civil society, we wouldn't be where we are. And I would like to use the occasion to thank my co-panelist, Michael Crowley, who has acted as consultant expert and has done tremendous work and has shown exemplary commitment to the whole process. The close cooperation with civil society was essential in the drafting process. I am convinced it is as essential for the implementation of the recommendation. I'm looking forward, together with all of you, to thinking about ways we can work together with civil society in the implementation of the recommendation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Nicola, for your very clear presentation and summing up obligations and recommendations. This is a very good start for the implementation process. The Council of Europe and the European Union have a long tradition of cooperation which draws on their shared values, human rights, democracy and the rule of law. Each benefits from the other's respective strengths and comparative advantages, competencies and expertise. It is my great pleasure to introduce our fourth panelist, Ms. Laura auger Beret, who is a senior expert of the European Commission Service for Foreign Policy Instruments, responsible for the EU's regulatory instruments, anti-torture and the Kimberley process. She will provide insight into the development and implementation of the EU anti-torture regulation and the lessons learned. The online floor is yours, Laura. Please do request the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. Good morning to everyone. I would like, first of all, to thank uh, very warmly uh, the German Presidency and the Council of Europe and organizers for the invitation extended to the European Union to participate in this event. I will be talking to you about the EU regulation. It has been mentioned uh, by previous panelists how it has served an example to develop uh, the Council of Euro recommendation. I would also touch upon the reports that the Commission has adopted in last year year in relation to regulation, and I will also conclude by mentioning one of the main follow-ups to that review exercise, which is uh, the establishment of an informal group of experts. 
as you know, the regulation was adopted in 2005 and it's a reflection of EU's strong commitment to eradicating torture and the death penalty. The regulation is pioneer in this area. It introduced uh, unprecedented binding trade restrictions on a range of goods that could be used for capital or torture. Unlike the Council of Europe a recommendation, which uh, is soft law, I would like to emphasize here that the EU regulation is binding, is legally binding and directly applicable in all European Union member states. As it has been explained by Nicola uh, in relation to the recommendation, the regulation, the recommendation mirrors the EU regulation. It has also three uh, categories of goods. First of all, the goods for, which have no practical use other than the, for the purpose of, of capital punishment, for example, electric chairs. In this category of goods, we're talking about a total trade ban, which comprises export, import, transit within the European Union, brokering services, training, advertising, and trade fairs. The second category of goods is those that could be used for purposes which are legitimate but could also be abused, for example, weapons and devices used for the purpose of riot control or self-protection. In this category of goods, same as the recommendation, companies based in the European Union need to require a license to export such goods to third countries. An authorization is also required for the supply of technical assistance or brokering services related to this category of goods. Thirdly, the EU legislation regulates trade related to certain chemicals which can be used for death penalty through lethal injection. The regulation has a mechanism to add goods that expand the scope of goods which are either prohibited or regulated. We will come to that when I talk about the review process. The competent authorities in the EU member states are responsible for the day-to-day -day impl implementation. They are responsible for assessing the applications for exports submitted by the companies. They are responsible for making a risk assessment uh, call as to whether authorize the export or not. Authorities in the member states, they also develop national um, penalties which are applicable to infringements against the regulation. According to the regulations, such penalties shall be effective, proportionate, and dissuasive. According to the regulation, also the member states' authorities have the obligation to report annually on these activities. The Commission, in parallel, gathers data from the authorities in the, in the member states, which in terms provides the basis for the preparation of the European Commission annual report on the implementation of the regulation, which is made available to the European Parliament and to the Council. The reports that were uh, most recently adopted were in December. One report was about the export authorizations that were granted, and the other was about the activities of the anti-torture coordination group. In terms of the exports, the report adopted in 2020, covering the year 2019, reported 285 authorizations that were granted, and they were so by 11 member states. So there is a significant number of EU member states that did not receive any application for authorizations according to the regulation. The number of applications that was refused, so the authorization uh, was uh, rejected and no export uh, was authorized, is six. These uh, refusals, or also called uh, denials, concerned goods that were intended for uh, customers in the following countries, Bosnia and Herzegovina, China, India, Israel, Nigeria, and Niger. The goods concerned by these denials were um, goods, uh, equipment, sorry, for the dissemination of incapacitating or irritating agents, whereas the goods intended for India were goods included in the Annex 4 to the regulation, which is the annex that includes chemicals that can be used uh, for lethal uh, injections. 
The second report that the Commission adopted, as I was saying, referred to the Anti-Torture Coordination Group. This is a platform that uh, comprises the EU member states' representatives, so the authorities which are responsible for the day-to-day -day implementation of the regulation, and this serves as a platform to exchange views on the implementation of the regulation. But most importantly, the Commission adopted uh, last year, in July 2020, a report about the uh, review of the regulation, so provide an assessment on how the regulation is implemented. Assessing its impact, influence on the global level, challenges and opportunities, the review outlines further action to make the regulation and its implementation more effective and to ensure it continues to make an important contribution to the fight against torture and the death penalty. The regulation, in line with EU better regulation guidelines, is also assessed uh, from the perspective of certain basic principles which are relevance, effectiveness, efficiency, coherence, and EU added value. As part of the review process that was undertaken last year, the Commission engaged with a wide range of stakeholders in particular with the authorities in the EU member states, international organizations, as well as civil society. The main conclusions that can be drawn from the review report are that the regulation has been instrumental in promoting respect for human life and fundamental human rights. It has also uh, highlighted that the regulation has filled an identified gap in EU human rights based trade controls. At the same time, the review highlights a number of issues where there is room for improvement or issues that the Commission is going to be looking at or is already looking at in the context of its uh, future work regarding to the regulation. For example, the review report highlights the need to respond to evolving technological and market developments and take account of changes in the nature of the use and misuse of law enforcement equipment. The review report also highlights the need to balance human rights considerations against the need to protect the trade of legitimate life-saving medical supplies. It also emphasizes the need for a greater transparency and accountability, notably by publishing annual activity reports by all EU member states. The, re the review report overall suggests looking at ways of more closely monitoring possible infringements of the regulation and the end use of exported goods. One of the main uh, conclusions uh, of the review report was uh, the establishment of a group of experts. This group of experts is actually now in preparation and is going to be formally established in the coming weeks. Coming weeks. It is intended as a platform to interact in manner with a wide range of stakeholders that will enable the Commission to engage in a continuous dialogue about a number of issues related to the regulation and more broadly related to torture-free trade. This group of experts will act in an advisory capacity and its role will be complementary to the role of the Anti-Torture Coordination Group, which, as I mentioned, is comprised exclusively of the authorities in the EU member states. The group of experts will provide technical support to the Commission to explore avenues to strengthen compliance and to make the regulation and its implementation more effective, looking at different aspects which have been highlighted in the review report, such as the scope of goods or the development of best practices in areas which may be particularly challenging. To conclude, as the world's first legally binding regulatory instrument in this area, the EU has served as an example for the development of trade measures. In September 2017, the EU, together with Argentina and Mongolia, launched the Alliance for Torture-Free Trade, which I understand will be addressed in more detail in the second panel of this uh, webinar. Since then, over 60 countries have joined the Alliance, members committed members that join the Alliance commit to take measures to control and restrict exports of such goods used through domestic legislation and efficient enforcement. The Commission is very, 
is supportive of this process and remains fully engaged to bring pro to bring it forward towards the establishment of common international standards in this field. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Laura, and the EU Commission for providing this insight. Uh, now I must ask you, um, after all these years since the very progressive EU regulation, uh, what are the challenges that you see still at the EU level? And of course, one interesting question is that, what can the EU do to share its, its very broad wide knowledge and, and challenges faced in this area with all Council of Europe member states, not only with those 27 EU member states, but, but with all of us? If you, Laura, are able to re reply to these questions now, so please request the floor. Thank you. We can see that Laura is online, but we cannot hear you. We cannot see you at the moment. Can you switch on your camera and microphone, please? Thank you. Can you hear me now? Yes, perfectly. Thank you. I am sorry, I'm still not fully proficient, sorry for that. I was saying that the, the regulation, uh, as I mentioned, was adopted uh, already back in 2005. It has been amended several times and over time it has been continuously strengthened. The review exercise and assessment that we conducted in 2020 has given us the opportunity to look in more detail and some aspects of the regulation where we can make it uh, more effective. One of the areas uh, was, as I mentioned, the, the need to look at the scope, to look to, the need to have more transparency and accountability, perhaps the need to look for guidance on certain aspects which can be more challenging. Uh, one of the challenges that we have found is that often we don't have enough information about the uh, data and volume and um, the price, le le the cost of all the trade that is involved and we are uh, increasing our efforts to be able to gather information in, in, in this regard. We have uh, now planned the establishment of this group of experts which we are confident we'll provide the Commission with the expertise needed to continue exploring uh, ways and means to strengthen the regulation and to make it even uh, more effective. We also hope that this group of experts can be used as a platform to create um, enhanced awareness about torture free trade more broadly and to be able to support in that way the UN process toward uh, establishment of uh, global uh, standards. How can we uh, promote the recommendation? How can we help the recommendation of the Council of Europe? I mean, this has been a, a very important uh, development. It has shown uh, cooperation and how the European Union and the Council of Europe can partner in the promotion of human rights. Uh, I can say that uh, the recently adopted uh, EU action plan on human rights uh, in this action plan, the promotion of the Alliance for Torture Free Trade is an important priority. We are looking at ways to see how we can uh, concretely uh, have initiatives to, to, to promote this alliance in the current uh, or rather in the new uh, financial framework that is being developed uh, at the moment. We are convinced that joint efforts with the Council of Europe, other regional organizations in other parts of the world, 
governments, national partners and civil society can make a real difference. And here today we recognize the, the important step uh, by the Council of Europe and the EU is uh, ready to assist in the process of making this recommendation and reality. Thank you. Thank you, Laura, and thank you for the EU Commission for this continuous cooperation in this regard. This is much, much appreciated. Um, next, I would like to ask uh, Nico, uh, independent member of the CPT, uh, what benefits will the recommendation bring from the CPT perspective? And how can we best ensure that the Council of Europe member states export control officials are kept fully informed of the relevant CPT reports? As you mentioned, you have such a high number uh, of these monitoring reports already uh, uncovering uh, the misuse of such law enforcement equipment. And, and similarly, uh, how can CPT reports uncovering inherently abusive equipment in certain countries be circulated to Co Council of Europe member states to facilitate the re removal and destruction of such goods? Merci, Madame la Présidente. Thank you, Chair. Well, what is the mandate of the CPT? Let me recall that uh, we're here to go and see places where people, people are deprived of liberty and we talk to them there. We're not here to control uh, trade in those goods, whether it's legal or partly illegal, but on the basis of the interviews and on the basis of our visits, we can come across objects which are banned. And then we talk about it in our reports. The reports are and then sent to governments with our recommendations. And we await a reply from national authorities. There is a, they have usually six months to respond with the government's agreement and as i said before there's already 12 member states that gave an automatic agreement for the publication of our reports and their positions the reports are made public then they're accessible to the parliamentary assembly of the council of europe they're uh, accessible to the committee of ministers the human rights court that then looks at complaints in the context of ill treatment and it's accessible to the public at large to the media to the european parliament so it is only through the publication of our findings when there are allegations that we hear about, only then can we uh, raise awareness about uh, things that happen that have to do with the recommendation, but we cannot act directly uh, on the ground. That's what I could uh, say in response to your uh, broad question. Thank you. Thank you, Nico, for providing comments from the CPT perspective. Uh, then I would like to ask from all panelists, uh, what first step should be taken for the implementation of the recommendation? As we have heard today, we have basically five years before the review of its implementation. So action must be taken now. What are the first steps? Uh, we must ensure that this trade is effectively regulated throughout the Council of Europe. So what are the first steps in this regard? And, and what can the Council of Europe member states do now to regulate this trade? Michael, please, you have the online floor. Um, um, the first step. 
Uh, the first step that all member states um, can and should do is to review their existing national controls uh, against the uh, the recommendation and um, uh, to yeah assess um, um, whether um, they need to introduce new controls. Um, certain when we undertook a feasibility study of uh, existing states' uh, controls in this area, and a number of states did not have um, any controls in this area. Certain states um, regulated uh, a limited range of goods, and uh, a number of states um, had uh, uh, controls on a wider range of goods. So. Uh, I think the first step is for all states to review their existing uh, uh, controls in the area and then to introduce uh, national controls or um, strengthen their controls uh, where appropriate. Um, and also, um, uh, there are elements of the recommendation which go beyond uh, the EU anti-torture regulations. So even EU states should uh, conduct this process. And, and one of the, um, the key innovative um, elements of the recommendation is that it, it includes um, um, the recommendation that um, all states that find inherently abusive um, equipment on their territories should destroy such equipment. Uh, that's not in the EU anti-torture regulation because that regulation just deals with uh, the trade aspect. So th that's a, a new area that all states can, can um, implement. Uh, a second um, uh, area that states can work on straight away from the, from the national level is uh, uh, promulgation and public awareness to all business communities uh, to um, alert them to their responsibilities in this area and to identify and make sure that they know which equipment is prohibited and which equipment is controlled. I think clarity in this area is vitally important. And similarly, um, uh, promulgation, uh, awareness raising needs to be uh, uh, made to uh, government officials involved in trade control and, and training uh, for uh, government officials um, involved in um, uh, export authorization processes in how to do uh, proper risk assessments and also for customs people um, in how to check and uh, uh, monitor the trade and recognize the goods that are prohibited. Um, so I think these are, are, are certain activities that states can and should be doing straight away. Thank you, Michael. Any other of the panelists would like to address this question? And in, in the meantime, uh, Michael, and, and this is also something what uh, Nicola already addressed uh, in her presentation, is the role of, of business companies in the implementation of this recommendation. What should their role be in this one? Nicola, please. Yes, thank you, Krista. I would just like to briefly follow up on what Michael has said about what member states should do and share some thoughts on what the Council of Europe as an organization can do. And I think one important aspect is knowledge sharing. Um, so this is something that always sounds a bit uh, unspectacular, but I think it is essential in this area because we have member states that have uh, experience um, already a number of years with with regulating the trade in the tools covered by the regulation and um, I think it would be helpful if we can find a way to share this knowledge um, in a very specific and technical manner about how we actually uh, control the trade what uh, forms have to be fulfilled. How does it work? How does the uh, how does the relevant authority gather information about uh, the way the goods are going to be used in another state? These are very technical but difficult questions. And if we manage to find a way, for example, uh, through the human rights and business platform of the Council of Europe to share um, 
the ways states work on these issues with other states, I think we could make a huge step forward. And then I give floor to Michael, please. And uh, I absolutely uh, support all the uh, points that Nicola um, made. I think it's um, really important that um, the recommendation isn't left for five years and that states um, uh, forget about it and, and then come back to it in five years' time to review it. I think it's, it's vital that um, this meeting uh, that we are conducting now um, is seen as um, the start of uh, a process of implementation. Um, and I think, as Nicola said, there are um, a number of, of, of ways in which the Council of Europe as a whole and, and various entities within it can help with um, information sharing, um, sharing of best practices. Individual states can, can, can um, uh, talk about their experiences, the challenges that they face, and how they um, um, developed a national control or, 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 or um, uh, regional controls to address the challenges. And I think um, for such as um, a technical work workshop by which uh, all member states can get together and, and look at um, the technical difficulties and, and how to overcome them in effective implementation of this recommendation uh, would be uh, a very useful um, uh, um, forum. And similarly, I think um, the, uh, again, as Nicola mentioned previously, uh, the Business and Human Rights platform uh, provides uh, you know, a potentially wonderful and rich resource and, and uh, opportunity for information sharing um, and uh, a means by which uh, for example, um, if the European Commission developed um, a guidance on, on uh, risk assessment or how to effectively um, oversee um, arms fairs, that could be shared on this platform. And this platform also hopefully will allow civil society um, organisations such as ourselves to, to um, share our research findings uh, with the other states. Uh, one little um, aspect that I'd just like to pick up from what Nico was saying was that uh, we in Omega have um, produced um, a guide uh, intended for uh, organizations uh, monitoring uh, places of detention and uh, um, yeah, other situations, uh, helping them to, to identify um, uh, particular uh, pieces of equipment and, and how to record such pieces of equipment, uh, because I think um, although the CPT you know has has identified and highlighted specific implements um, being used in torture uh, around the world, there are a number of um, uh, anti-torture organisations and and uh, torture uh, uh, monitoring bodies um, that could. Um, do similar work in identifying the specific types of equipment used for torture and other ill treatment because and then to share that information because such information will be vital for those um, government officials in exporting states when they undertake uh, risk assessments so i feel that um it's a um the issue of uh, the torture trade and the instruments being used for torture um, isn't just a concern of exporting states, but it's a concern of the entire anti-torture community. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Nicola and Michael, for providing quite uh, concrete proposals. And it seems that we already have structures we can use, such as the Business and Human Rights Platform, as Nicola mentioned. And, and thank you, Michael, for providing this proposal to organize a technical workshop. Um, the outcome of this uh, uh, webinar will be reported to the Steering Committee for Human Rights for its consideration.
Uh, dear participants, dear panelists, I would like to thank everyone for bringing your expertise and experience to this panel today and engaging in such fruitful and open exchanges throughout our discussion. Indeed, you are shaping an important dialogue and providing concrete tools for the implementation of this new recommendation. So let me conclude by thanking all of you for your valuable insights. Now we have, we have a coffee break and tea break of 15 minutes and the webinar will continue on the second panel immediately thereafter. Thank you. Good morning. Um, again, a warm welcome to all participants in our webinar this morning. I, I, I understand from my colleagues that we have around 70 participants with us this morning, so I would like to thank them all very warmly for being with us this morning. I hope that uh, you will all have a chance to contribute to the discussions that we will have now in the context of the second panel of our webinar, which is devoted to the question of uh, how to promote international action to address the trades in goods used for death penalty, torture, and other ill treatment. As an introduction, I would only refer to what Mrs. Calamar said in the uh, introduction during the opening session where Mrs. Calamar referred to the need, and I quote, for a worldwide push towards the, the regulating uh, this, this trade, um, it is clear that beyond what regional organizations like the Council of Europe, and, and I would also mention the European Union, so beyond what regional organizations can do, there is obviously a need for action at a broader level, at the global level. Um, involving all the actors that were mentioned during the first panel discussion, and I want to thank very warmly the experts in the first panel, and together with Krista Oynonen, the moderator of the first panel, I would refer to what the different uh, um, categories of actors they mentioned. First of all, of course, the states, but also international organizations, civil society institutions, and the businesses, uh, uh, of course. Um, so. I think that our panel is a very good opportunity to look at what those different categories of actors can do to take action at the international level. In that context, I would draw a bit, before I give the floor to the panelists, I would draw a bit on what was said by the previous experts. I would refer in particular to what Mrs. Auger Perez from the European Commission indicated the very useful information she provided about the review report on the EU regulation, which has identified, as she said, room for improvement. I suppose that, in a way, the conclusions of the review report uh, and, and the future establishment of the group of experts um, might be useful in the context of the action to be taken at the international level. I would also refer to um, the very useful proposals that were made by uh, Mr. Crowley and Nicola Wetzel in terms of action to be taken by the Council of Europe. And I want to say in that context that uh, we took very careful note of these very useful proposals. I believe that these proposals are also interesting to look at in a broader context, in the international context. When, for instance, Nicola Wetzel referred to, the, to sharing knowledge among states about, about good practices, experience uh, from different public authorities. I think that is certainly something that could and should be promoted, I would say, at the international level. I would also refer to what Mr. Crowley said about organizing training and awareness raising activities. Of course, it is important at the international level to have a proper framework in place in terms of a um, legal uh, instruments, but beyond those legal instruments and to make them lively instruments to make sure they are effectively implemented, it is of course also important to develop training and awareness raising. Having said that, I will now turn to the first panelist, Mrs. Anna Crow. Mrs. Crow is Assistant Director at the International Human Rights Clinic at the Harvard Law School. Mrs. Crow will uh, give us 
an overview of all international instruments precisely, not only legally binding in the form of treaties, but also other international texts, declarations, and reports, and that will allow us to, to set the scene, and thereafter we will move on to our second speaker. But first of all, I give the floor to Mrs. Crow. Mrs. Crow, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you to the organisers for putting together this webinar and for the opportunity to speak here today. So in this presentation, I'm going to run through the international human rights law obligation to prohibit and prevent torture and discuss how this obligation leads to a duty on states to regulate the trade in law enforcement equipment. So starting with the obligation to prohibit and prevent torture and cruel, inhuman or degrading treatment or punishment. This obligation appears in the terms noted here in all of the international treaties that I've listed, which most countries in the world are party to. The prohibition is also contained in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and is part of international humanitarian law, the law that applies alongside human rights law during armed conflict. The prohibition of torture is so significant in international law uh, that it's considered use cogens. In other words, a fundamental norm of customary international law. So even if you had a state that wasn't party to one or another of these treaties, torture and other ill treatment is still prohibited absolutely for that state under international law. So I'd like to highlight two treaties in particular, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the ICCPR, and the Convention Against Torture. The ICCPR is one of the foundational treaties of international human rights law, and it sets out the right to be free from torture in Article 7. The Convention Against Torture, meanwhile, provides more specificity and detail on measures to prevent and prohibit torture. So there are also a variety of regional treaties and instruments uh, that likewise prohibit torture and other ill treatment and provide guidance on prevention and response uh, noted here. So I've highlighted here the core elements of the definition of torture. So it's severe mental or physical pain or suffering intentionally inflicted on a person for the purpose of obtaining information to punish, to coerce, or for reasons based on discrimination. Under some treaties, notably the Convention Against Torture, you also need the involvement or acquiescence of the state, a state official, to meet the definition. So in terms of what's meant by cruel, inhuman or degrading treatment or punishment, what's often referred to as other ill treatment, the Human Rights Committee, which is the body of independent experts constituted under the ICCPR to monitor its implementation, has said that it's not necessary to establish sharp distinctions between torture and other ill treatment. Rather, distinctions are going to depend on the nature, the purpose and severity of the treatment applied. So under international human rights law, not unsurprisingly, states are required to take measures to give effect to their obligations. So you see this reflected in Article 2.1 of the ICCPR. And the Convention Against Torture also contains a similar provision requiring states to take effective measures to prevent torture. And in addition, the Convention outlines a range of other specific steps, such as criminalizing torture, that states are required to take effect to give effect to the prohibition uh, and the prevention of torture. So over the last several decades, there has been a progressive evolution of understandings about how the prohibition on torture uh, and the obligation to take effective measures to prevent torture relate to the trade in law enforcement equipment. And I highlight here key examples at the level of soft law. The second bullet point quotes language on the topic, for example, that's appeared for at least the last decade in the UN General Assembly's biannual resolution on torture. I'd also note the 2019 UN General Assembly resolution, which is intended to explore the potential development of international standards in goods used for torture, other ill treatment and the death penalty. And that's a process that uh, my co-panelist, the next speaker, will be addressing. So a series, a series of special rapporteurs on torture, independent experts of the UN Commission on Human Rights and its successor, the UN Human Rights Council, have also articulated standards and interpretations in this area and move forward understandings of what's required to give effect to the obligation to prevent torture. Notably in 2003, a special rapporteur on torture 
stated his view that the enactment of legal and other measures to stop the production and trade of equipment specifically designed to inflict torture or other cruel, inhuman or degrading treatment is part of the obligation under Article 2 of the Convention Against Torture to prevent acts of torture. And here you see a special rapporteur on torture making recommendations to states concerning trade in the two categories of equipment referred to in the Council of Europe recommendation that this webinar um, has discussed, although in slightly different terms. So first, to prohibit the transfer of inherently abusive equipment, and second, to introduce strict export controls on legitimate equipment to prevent it from being used for torture. At the regional level, uh, the instruments listed here each address in some way the trade and the tools of torture, including, of course, um, the Council of Europe recommendation. Significantly, under all three of these regional instruments, states should not only prohibit trade in inherently abusive equipment, but also control the trade in law enforcement equipment that could be misused. So a 2017 report from the Special Rapporteur on Torture contains probably the clearest articulation of the argument that the obligation to prevent torture entails a duty to regulate the trade in law enforcement equipment. And here, although the Special Rapporteur speaks in terms of weapons, the way he uses the term weapon in his report indicates that he's including a broad variety of law enforcement equipment. So as he notes, Given that states must prevent the use of inherently cruel and human or degrading weapons and of lawful weapons in a manner contrary to the prohibition of torture, they necessarily have a derived duty to regulate and review the trade of weapons. And he says that this duty includes an obligation to determine whether in some or all circumstances uh, the weapon would violate the absolute prohibition of torture. And here the phrase in some or all circumstances it is significant because that would cover not only inherently abusive equipment, but also any equipment that in some circumstances could be misused for torture. Finally, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that there is an international treaty that already requires states to undertake an assessment of risks to human rights when they export certain types of weapons, some of which could be used in law enforcement, namely the Arms Trade Treaty, which has 110 states parties. So under Article 7 of that treaty, states parties must assess whether proposed exports could be used to commit or facilitate serious violations of international human rights law and deny an export application if there is an overriding risk. The prohibition on torture is use cogens, as I mentioned, so a significant risk of torture would be a classic example of when an export um, would be denied under the Arms Trade Treaty. In any event, even without the Arms Trade Treaty, under the concept of complicity in international law, there is an argument that a state could be held internationally responsible for torture perpetrated using equipment it allowed to be exported if it knew that that equipment would be used to carry out torture. Uh, so in conclusion, in my view, I would agree with the Special Rapporteur that it's clear that there's a derived duty to regulate the trade and law enforcement equipment as part of the obligation to prohibit and prevent torture and other ill treatment. And that this duty means not only prohibiting trade in inherently abusive equipment, but also regulating the trade in legitimate equipment to account for the risk of equipment being misused for torture. As a result, in the new UN process that my co-panelist is about to discuss, I think it would be quite reasonable to expect that any new instrument would cover both categories of equipment. I hope this has been a helpful overview and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Crow. Indeed, it was a very good, very interesting and very informative overview, very comprehensive also, I must say, and which shows that there is in fact a combination of a international texts that are relevant when we look at a, what can be done at the international level, because you referred to, first of all, human rights instruments, but also to a instruments dealing even with trade in arms and, uh, and also with a, um, um, a, a trade in more general terms. Um, I, I noted what you said at the end in your conclusion about the fact that states have not only a duty to abstain from a uh, practicing torture and, 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 and need treatment, but there is also, as you said, a, a more positive obligation on states, a duty on states to, to take action and, 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 and regulate in particular the 
the trade of such uh, goods and in, in such goods and services. So, I think it's a a very important element to bear in mind is this notion of positive obligation, which I must say we have also in Europe under the European Convention on, on Human Rights with regard to several uh, fundamental freedoms that are contained in the European Convention on uh, Human Rights. Before I give the floor to Mrs. Van Hood, because I think uh, uh, her presentation will naturally follow uh, the indications just given to by Mrs. Crow. I would also refer to what you said, uh, Mrs. Crow, about the need to, uh, to, to be alerted to new challenges and new developments that, uh, that happen. And, and the, uh, the, uh, I would quote what you said about the constant emergence and deployment of new technologies. So I suppose that in, in, in any, under any initiative that may be taken at the international level to address the problem, there is a need to be alerted to the development of new technologies. Uh, I don't know to what extent, for instance, the, the development of a artificial intelligence may have an impact, for instance, on, on those matters, but I, I would suppose that, uh, as I said, uh, any initiative would, uh, would need to be particularly attentive to, the, to this question of the development of, of technologies. Having said that, I will now give the floor to Mrs. Birgit van Hoot, who is the regional representative for Europe of the office of the um, OHCHR. Um, I think it's very good that we have with us Mrs. Van Hoot this morning because she will be able to explain to us what is the current uh, thinking within the framework of the United Nations on taking steps to, in a way, reinforce the existing uh, legal framework, take further action um, to, to, in a way, complement and, uh, and strengthen the initiatives that may have been taken at the regional level. With that, Mrs. Van Hoot, I give you the floor with a great pleasure. You have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Excellencies, dear colleagues. I would like to convey the greetings of UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, Michelle Bachelet, to the organizers and participants of today's meeting. Our office warmly welcomes the adoption of the recommendation of 31 March 2021 by the Council of Europe's Committee of Ministers. There is no doubt that international law clearly and unconditionally prohibits torture. And as we've heard, no derogation from this rule is permitted under any circumstance. In fact, the international community has long been united in its condemnation of torture, with 171 states having ratified the Convention Against Torture and other cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment or punishment. The treaty, as we know, entered into force already on 26 June 1987. Successive UN Special Rapporteurs on Torture have also called for an end to the development, production, trade and use of weapons, as well as other means of deploying force that are inherently cruel, inhuman or degrading. It is abhorrent that goods which sole purpose it is to inflict torture and ill treatment on human beings are still being produced and traded. Putting an end to torture has been at the forefront of our work globally. Our High Commissioner has welcomed the Global Alliance for Torture-Free Trade, and we hope many more countries will join this initiative. The relentless efforts of the Global Alliance led to the adoption by the UN General Assembly in June 2019 of its resolution 73-304 entitled Towards Torture-Free Trade. To implement this resolution, in March 2020, we sent out a questionnaire to all states to ask their views on the feasibility and the possible scope of a range of options to establish common international standards for the import, export, export and transfer of goods used for A, capital punishment, or B, torture or other cruel, inhuman or degrading treatment or punishment. 46 
UN member states responded to the questionnaire. And the report of the UN Secretary General, which was published in September 2020, compiles and analyzes the responses received. The report shows an uneven situation with respect to regulating the trade in goods used for capital punishment or torture, both between the various regions and between states. Clearly, the establishment of common international standards could ensure more effective regulation. The majority of states who responded to the questionnaire expressed support for the establishment of common international standards. They also shared legal, practical, and other considerations for the possible scope of a range of options. Most states highlighted the need to prohibit the trade in goods that have no practical use other than for the purpose of capital punishment, torture, or other forms of ill treatment. Similarly, most respondents also expressed the, needs, the need to control goods that might have a legitimate purpose, but could also be used for capital punishment, torture, or other forms of ill treatment. Most states who responded to the questionnaire were also in favor of a legally binding instrument, although some called for flexibility until the scope of the standards was further defined. The report of the Secretary General also reflected the views of UN member states on other important aspects, such as the need to establish a mechanism and criteria for risk assessment of trade in such goods, and the importance of expert authorization requirements, as well as end-use verification as appropriate mechanisms. We take good note of paragraph 6.1 of the recommendation of the Council of Ministers, of the Committee of Ministers of the Council of Europe, which stipulates that member states of the Council of Europe should promote action in relevant international forums, and that particular attention should be given to the UN processes. As we've heard from other speakers, the UN guiding principles on business and human rights are a useful starting point for further discussions on common international standards in this area. In line with the guiding principles, companies involved in trading goods that could be used for capital punishment, torture, or other forms of ill treatment should carry out human rights due diligence. We also echo UN Secretary General's view that there is a need to broaden engagement with the process and to further consult UN member states across all regions, as well as other stakeholders, in order to shape a broad consensus as the process moves forward. Our office is currently supporting the UN Secretary General in his efforts to establish the group of governmental experts. There have been delays in the establishment of this group, but we hope that it can start working on examining the feasibility, the scope of the goods to be included, and the draft parameters for a range of options to establish common international standards very soon. Excellencies, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, no state and no company should export torture. No state should permit the sale of equipment which use would be illegal in their own country. And no state should turn a blind eye to the final use of products made on its territory. And I'm happy to witness today that the Council of Europe has taken a firm step in this direction. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Van Hoot. It was very good and very interesting to listen to your presentation. Um, I would refer in particular to what you indicated about the steps taken after the adoption of the resolution 73304 by the UN General Assembly in 2019. Uh, the, the questionnaire that was sent to uh, the member states of the UN, the replies that were collected 
afterwards and uh, the interesting and uh, encouraging indication that a, a majority of the respondent states have indicated that they are in favor of a, uh, having legally binding standards at the international level to address this issue. I, I just noted that, uh, unfortunately, I would say only 46 of the member states of the United Nations responded to the questionnaire. I would believe that these are the most uh, interested and committed states, but I, at the same time, we would hope that uh, uh, those, who have, those states that have not responded to the questionnaire would, uh, would follow the, the same line. And from that perspective, I must say, it was also very interesting to hear what you said about the forthcoming establishment of a, of a group of governmental experts. This is a, um, a very promising uh, initiative. Like you, we, we hope that this group will be established uh, very soon, as you said. And, and to conclude, I would say that uh, the Council of Europe, of course, remains uh, more than willing to, to work together with the United Nations in this field. We have a long-standing cooperation between our two organizations regarding the fight towards the abolition of the death penalty in particular. So be assured that the Council of Europe is a is side by side with the UN in this, uh, in this endeavor. Thank you very much again, Mrs. Van Hoot, and uh, we, we, I'm sure we will have uh, the opportunity to, to discuss the UN initiative uh, in further details later. But before that, I would now like to give the floor to Mr. Patrick Wilken, who is Deputy Director in charge of the Global Issues Program in Amnesty International, and I take this opportunity to thank very warmly Amnesty International for co-hosting this uh, webinar together with the German Chairmanship of the Committee of Ministers and I want to thank also of course the German authorities for um, retaining this topic as one of the um, elements of their program uh, of their chairmanship which is coming to an end this Friday in Hamburg. Many thanks also so to the German Chairmanship and many thanks also to the Omega Research Foundation for being also a, a co-sponsor of this event. With that, I will now give the floor to Mr. Wilken. Mr. Wilken will present to us the initiatives that are being developed uh, by civil society to, to the same end, meaning um, how to regulate the trade in goods and services used for torture and treatment and, and the death and penalty and executions. With that, Mr. Wilken, I give you the floor. Thanks very much, um, Chair. I'd like to thank the, the German Presidency, my fellow, fellow panellists, uh, for an extremely interesting and informative um, event today, which I hope will build a platform for you know, further regulation, um, including at the international level. And I just wanted to start by saying that, you know, from my perspective, I work at Amnesty International, which is obviously an international human rights organisation, that is uh, documenting these instances of abuse, uh, torture and other ill treatment around the world, that this really is a global issue and it's a global issue that um, we are documenting constantly um, in all regions of the world. So we have recently done a big project on the misuse of tear gas over 22 countries looking at 80 separate instances where we, we noted uh, widespread, very aggressive and punitive use, um, including firing of tear gases directly at protesters in, in Venezuela, inside a hospital in, in Sudan and in the metro system in, in Hong Kong. Um, we've also done a piece of work on the protests in, in Lebanon and seen uh, the use of all sorts of uh, less lethal equipment that's covered by some of these regulations. Um, including the, the, the indiscriminate firing of, of rubber bullets directly into crowds. Um, and one shocking case that we uncovered um, was uh, in Saudi Arabia recently, where Ethiopian um, migrants that were in detention were re repeatedly subjected to electric shock batons on, on their backs um, over a period of time. And I would say that from my, my own work, I used to work um, as a researcher on the human rights situation in Brazil. Um, I have uh, interviewed uh, detainees across the country from Amazon State to, to Rio and Sao Paulo states, 
And I have heard uh, numerous accounts of torture where um, equipment such as you know, handcuffs used for stress positions um, and also electric shock devices and often the equipment used in combination. So this is, is truly an international um, problem that needs an international solution. So looking at um, a UN instrument, what could that look like? I mean, I think um, the first thing is to say um, from the work that the Amiga Research Foundation Amnesty International has been doing, um, we're looking at drafting a, 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 a sort of framework instrument that would um, pull out the, the elements that would be needed for a, a UN instrument. But the first thing I would say is um, that it would be structurally similar to the Council of Europe uh, recommendation and the, the regulations already in place across the EU, in as much as um, it would, in our view, separate out, as has been noted throughout uh, today's um, event, on one side, the inherently abusive equipment um, that needs to be prohibited, and on the other side, um, equipment that could be readily misused for torture and other ill treatment, which needs to be controlled. And it would also cover um, death penalty equipment, particularly uh, pharmaceutical chemicals, which are used in lethal injections. Um, but obviously, it would be different in some sense because it is an international rather than regional um, initiative. And I, you know, in, in my view, in the view of Amnesty International, it could be even more ambitious uh, than the, the, the laudable initiatives in the EU and, and the Council of Europe. So I just wanted to uh, look at just a couple of areas um, and give a few thoughts about a couple of areas where I think thought uh, really has to be given. So um, these include the scope of the goods covered, which has already been mentioned today, what risks should be assessed, um, how information can best be shared between states. Again, that's been mentioned in the, in the context of the Council of Europe. Um, crucially, um, mechanisms for oversight and implementation, because a lot of these international agreements founder on implementation. There's a lot of goodwill and there's a lot of work that goes into drafting, but when the push comes to shove, um, it, it, it uh, founders on, on that fundamental issue. And then I'd also like to just reinforce the comments that have been made by several of my fellow panellists um, on the important role that business can play and how um, business responsibilities to respect human rights can be referenced and, and integrated into uh, an international instrument. So just taking those issues one by one on scope, um, I think we would advocate the widest possible scope and for the reason that um, a lot of equipment, even very simple and basic equipment, we see being misused uh, on a weekly basis around the world. And you know, in that sense, we're currently carrying out research on the misuse of police batons. It's a low-tech technology, but um, we are seeing uh, instances of beatings of peaceful protesters with batons, beatings of fleeing protesters in, in many regions and countries around the world. Another issue, I think, is that some equipment that is currently in a sort of controlled um, uh, category should really be elevated to a um, to, to being um, prohibited, and, and the key example here is direct contact electric shock equipment, which, in our view, does not really have a legitimate um, role in law enforcement. And here, I'm not talking about the standoff taser weapons um, that can be used, as, as Michael pointed out in place of a firearm in certain limited circumstances uh, where there's risk of imminent threat to, to life or serious injury. Um, direct contact electric shock in, in some senses appear really to be designed for torture and other ill treatment in the sense that they can be used um, and without leaving marks um, on, on individuals and they can be used uh, for you know, all sorts of uh, types of torture and, and ill treatment. 
Going on, looking at the, the risk assessments, well, the risk assessments, again, it's a key area. How do you assess risks? How can you, um, uh, you know, really pin down the threshold uh, where, where the risks become too great and there, there needs to be uh, trade controls? It's an issue that, that um, is, is, is a very live issue in the arms trade treaty um, as well. And I think that we have to draw on the most authoritative independent information, including court records, UN bodies, torture prevention bodies and, and NGO reports. And we have to include factors such as prevalence of discriminatory use of force, including gender-based violence. And all those factors have to go into, you know, be taken into account uh, when assessing licences. Um, uh, Nicola has al al already mentioned information exchange um, at the Council of Europe level. I think the international level is absolutely fundamental. And one particular area of in information exchange, which is really important, I think, is license denials. And I think it's important for states to know uh, wh where other states are denying transfers so that you can build uh, a common standards that are consistent and that there's consensus over which types of transfers are problematic and which export destinations might be of, of concern. So on implementation, I think uh, one, one thought is that um, often when uh, there's the creation of international instruments, it's very difficult to resource uh, monitoring uh, and, and implementation. And here, I think we can draw on the a lot of the resources, the sort of torture prevention resources that already exist, and we can try and um, join up uh, the various efforts um, into a sort of common goal. So here, I'm thinking about the national preventive mechanisms, the Committee Against Torture, the UN Special Rapporteur on Torture, and of course um, the CPT, as we, we've heard earlier. And I think that they can all play a role in documenting. Um, equipment, because all, all these various individuals and organisations are commonly going into places of detention and and reporting on acts of torture and ill-treatment, and often the equipment is missed out of um, the accounts that, 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 they, that they give, not um, just because that is not the focus of, of their attention. And I also feel that um, there's, there are the arms trade treaty has been mentioned, and, and that is now five, more than five years old, and it has gone through many of the issues that will come up with an inter international instrument. So the development of national control systems um, and the monitoring of a certain types of weapons can be there can be synergies between arms control and um, an instrument. Uh, an anti-torture instrument. And finally, um, it's been mentioned several times by several panellists, and I, I want to sort of come in behind, uh, in a supportive way behind what's been said previously, but we have the whole business and human rights um, area, which is gathering momentum, uh, particularly in Europe, with efforts to uh, bring in mandatory human rights and environmental due diligence. And I think that an international instrument can reference and try and integrate um, the, the discourse of business and human rights, uh, particularly the state obligation to ensure that businesses are um, carrying out uh, a thorough due diligence. And we've seen this uh, working well um, in the case of the pharmaceutical industry. And the pharmaceutical industry, at least in Europe, has, has um, actively implemented proactive due diligence to prevent um, their goods from being used in execution protocols. So with business on side, I think a, a lot more can be achieved. Um, so finally, I'd just like to, to thank everyone um, for their contrib contributions today. I think it's been a, a great event. And I, I would like to reinforce to, to reinforce what um, Agnes Kalamar, our new Secretary General, has said. Our great um, appreciation for the efforts in the, the Council of Europe, the, the landmark um, recommendation, which I think uh, really sets a strong platform for the ongoing struggle for 
um, global regulations, which we hope will be legally binding um, and will be swiftly um, adopted. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Wilken. I must say I, I found your presentation very, very rich of ideas as to what could be the content of what you called a, a possible framework instrument at the international level. I noted in particular your ideas about what could be the scope of such an instrument, and you referred very specifically to certain types of equipment that could be uh, directly mentioned in such an instrument. I refer also to what you said about the importance of a providing with it such an instrument, a, a framework for an exchange of information among states, in particular on the question of a granting or refusing to grant licenses, export licenses. I think it's a, it is indeed a, an important element to note. I noted also what you said about putting in place a mechanism to uh, oversee the implementation of the instrument. As we all know, this is a, most of the time the, the, the crux of the matter when it comes to international instruments, what mechanism to put in place to make sure that the standards defined in these international instruments are indeed effectively applied. So that is a, an important element. And I noted what you said about uh, the fact that we could draw to a large extent, if not entirely, on existing anti-torture mechanisms and bodies. Um, and finally, I would note what you said about the, the importance of integrating businesses themselves under such an instrument uh, through a duty of, uh, uh, an obligation of due diligence. Um, I think that is also a, a very pertinent um, suggestion that you, you have made. So many, many thanks, Mr. Wilken, for your very useful ideas. Um, we still have 10 minutes for a discussion, roughly. Um, I'm looking at the list, request list, but I can see that at the moment no one wishes to take the floor. So in that case, perhaps I would turn to both Mrs. Crow and Mrs. Van Hood to Mrs. Crow, I would be interested to, to, to hear what are your views uh, following what uh, uh, Mr. Wilken uh, mentioned about the possible elements of, a, of an international instrument. From your own overview of the international standards, um, would you agree with the assessments uh, made by Mr. Wilken? Would you see any other areas that should be covered in a potential new international instrument? That would be my questions to you. And thereafter, I can see that there is on my screen one participant that wants to take the floor, but first I will give the floor to Mrs. Crow if she's uh, willing to answer my question. Mrs. Crow, please. Thank you. Um, I think I'd, I'd absolutely agree with um, what Mr. Wilkin just outlined uh, in terms of the elements of, of a new instrument. Um, and I think, you know, as many panelists have already discussed, that sort of two, two categories of equipment, inherently abusive equipment that should be absolutely prohibited, um, that you could have a range of measures around prohibiting production, stockpiling, use, etc., And then a, a, another category of equipment, which is the legitimate equipment that could then be misused and having some type of assessment of risk um, that it could be used for purposes contrary to, to human rights law. Uh, and I think it, it's, it's important what um, Mr. Wilkin mentioned as well about thinking about um, including a, a, an encompassing um, definition um, in that space and making sure that, for example, gender-based violence is something that's, that, or, or torture perpetrated on the basis of discrimination uh, is really clearly um, included as part of that risk assessment. So that, those, would be, those would be some elements that I think are, I would agree are very important. Thank you very much, Mrs. Crow. Before I give the floor to Mr. Kieru, may I perhaps give the floor to Mrs. Van Hood? I know it's difficult perhaps for you, Mrs. Van Hood, to, to express a view since the, the group of governmental experts is not yet in place. But I, if, we, if you would like to comment on the, what was said by, by the two other speakers, and in particular the ideas that were put forward by 
Mr. Wilken, you are, you are most welcome. So, Mrs. Van Hood, yes, please. And then I will give the floor to Mr. Kjellum. Mrs. Van Hood first. Thank you very much. And indeed, it would be uh, premature for me to uh, make a pronunciation exactly on, on the scope and the content uh, of, of such an instrument or a standard to be developed in light of the fact that uh, the governmental uh, group of uh, experts uh, is still to be constituted. Now, may maybe if you allow me, I would just say a few words about that. Uh, According to the General Assembly Resolution 73-304, the report of the group has to be submitted uh, to the 75th session of the General Assembly. And that closes on 13 September 2021. So we know we will have the report by then. And uh, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we, we are still to, to receive the last nomination to the group, uh, but then it should go quite quickly. Uh, and then, of course, what action um, will be taken or can be taken by the General Assembly will depend greatly on the findings and the recommendations of, of the group of experts. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Van Hoot. We, we, of course, fully understand that it's difficult for you at this stage to, to take any position on what could be the content of a possible new instrument, but we took good note of a what you indicated uh, regarding the time frame, and uh, so we will look forward to the next steps with a great interest. And with that, I will now give the floor to one of our participants, Mr. Kerum. Mr. Kerum, please take the floor. I hope you can all hear me now. Um, okay, yes. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Esker Kiram. I'm, I'm one of the two uh, nominated uh, experts for the UN group uh, from the WIAG region. Um, I would just like to uh, take a minute to thank all the speakers uh, for an incredibly enriching discussion, uh, which certainly for, for my uh, part uh, has given a, a lot of food for thought uh, in terms of uh, of, uh, of the future work of, of the group that, that we hope will be uh, constitu constituted very soon. Um, I personally look very much forward to, uh, to learning from all the experience in both the EU and now the Council of Europe system, um, but also trying to see how can we actually make this, this a global uh, instrument and make sure that it is uh, effective uh, in all of the regions of the world. And just one question, maybe for for for, the, for all of you, and um, that that I've been grappling with, is when we talk about the monitoring systems and using the existing anti-torture uh, mechanisms, both at the UN and regional uh, and national level, <clears throat> I think we have a bit of a task in front of us in terms of figuring out how they can actually collect relevant and reliable information that can be used in these national uh, decisions on licensing, which uh, in my experience often will require uh, a, a fairly uh, solid uh, standard of proof that may not be the, the methodology usually used uh, by some of these mechanisms. Um, I agree uh, completely with what Patrick uh, said about making sure that we use the existing infrastructure uh, instead of just reinventing new. Um, but in that situation, and, and, and it would be very interesting to hear if there's already experience with this, for example, uh, in the EU system, where information from these mechanisms uh, has been used in decision making at the national level, uh, and how that has, uh, has, has functioned. Um, so, so that's it uh, for now, but I would just really like to thank everyone for, for a, a very interesting discussion, and I look forward to taking the, this uh, work uh, forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Kjerum, for your contribution. You raised a very pertinent and important question, which is how to, in practice, make sure that the monitoring mechanism works effectively, drawing on reliable information, as you said. Um, so I would now turn to all the speakers, not only from the second panel, but also for, from the first panel, since you mentioned in particular the European Union experience. 
Does any of the speakers want to speak? Mrs. Auger, I see on my screen. Mrs. Auger, please, you have the floor. Thank you very much for, for giving me the, the floor again. Uh, I just wanted to come back to the issue mentioned by, uh, uh, by Asger uh, Gaerum. Uh, in the EU regulation, we the decisions to authorize the export for authorizations are taken, as I explained, by the member state uh, authorities. And the regulation provides um, a number of uh, criteria uh, based on which uh, decisions uh, should be taken. This criteria is that there has to be, um, the, the, the authorizations will be refused if there are re uh, reasonable grounds to believe that they might be used for torture or for the death penalty. And they also list uh, the sources of information that may be taken to inform those decisions, and those includes information by civil society, court rulings, and other uh, UN and international organizations. So there is some kind of narrative in the regulation itself that provides criteria for informing uh, uh, risk assessment, but those uh, processes, if you wish, uh, are not uh, shared uh, among all the member states, and this is one issue that we would like to, to be looking in our uh, group of experts. I hope this uh, is helpful in, in responding to, to your question. Thank you very much, Mrs. Auger. That's a I'm sure Mr. Kierum took good note of what you said. And now I see Mrs. Crow wants also to react. Mrs. Crow, please. Uh, yes, just very briefly. Um, I think it's important to note, I think that the example of um, the arms trade treaty could be could be useful to think about in this context. Uh, and in the case of the risk assessment there, Obviously, past behaviour of states and the way in which weapons have been used previously is very important in considering whether there's a risk going forward. But an assessment of risk is ultimately a forward-looking exercise rather than an exercise of assigning liability for something that happened in the past. So sort of thinking about risk in forward-looking terms um, rather than thinking about requiring absolute proof of a particular export having been used in the past um, for, for torture. So I think that that might be a, a helpful way um, to draw on some of the, the practice and commentary around risk assessment in the arms trade treaty in this space. Thanks. Thank you very much, Mrs. Crow. Um, is there anyone else who wants to take the floor? At the moment, no, I see no one on the screen. So perhaps I would uh, ask one question to our speakers, which is that we, we refer to the possible elements of a new international instrument, and that was very useful. Um, a question that was noted in the first session is, of course, the need to equip the people uh, who will deal with those questions at the national level with the necessary knowledge to to be able to, to do their job effectively. Um, not to say that that should be included in an international instrument, but uh, in, in your opinion, is this an area where specific efforts should also be put on the international scene to promote the training of a, uh, officials, law enforcement officials or customs officials or other representatives of national administrations to make sure that a, the implementation of the international framework and uh, beyond the national framework is as effective as possible. That would be my question. Mr. Wilken is on my screen. Mr. Wilken, you want to respond? Sorry. Um, I, I, I think, yes, that is, is crucial. Um, and again, just drawing back, going back to the Arms Trade Treaty, I think one of the, the you know, the Arms Trade Treaty has has had a, a mixed track record. Um, it, it's worked in some ways and not in others. But the, where it has worked is that it's brought together an international community of um, customs officials and license officials. And um, there you have, of course, um, the more mature um, systems, perhaps the states that have larger volumes of exports of conventional weapons, 
that that have naturally um, been paired and and have mentored uh, states with perhaps um, smaller and less developed uh, systems. So I think there's been a natural process of training in just gathering these these groups together through working groups, which happen throughout the year, and the conference of states parties, which which happens in in August. Um, and I, I understand that. Um, the Global Alliance, you know, just by having the Global Alliance, I think, and having events in New York uh, has also uh, brought together um, a lot of the, the, the players and protagonists in, in this area. And I think that there's a natural process of, um, of, of uh, mutual education that comes through that. And I think there could also be more formal workshops um, to, to educate and to make um, states aware of uh, the instrument and, and how it can be implemented. Thank you very much, Mr. Wilkins. And in a way, you reinforce what was said by Mr. Crowley in the first session. Now I will give the floor for a final statement by Mrs. Van Hoot, and then we will move to the closing session. I'm sorry, we have a short of time. Mrs. Van Hoot, please. Thank you very much, and thank you to, to all the speakers. And uh, um, I think I, I would like to maybe take advantage of the fact that we have here interlocutors from, from the various organizations, and, uh, the different regional frameworks, just to say that as a, as a general principle, it is so important that there is complementarity between what are the international uh, commitments and the legal obligations uh, of states and uh, what exists at a regional level, whether at the level of the Council of Europe or the European Union. And that's from our experience also where we see that things can get really complicated for the people at national level who are supposed to uh, implement uh, the obligation deriving from, from the different uh, uh, systems. So what I would say is for a matter of legal certainty, whether it's for states or for domestic courts, it is really useful um, at least that's what we have found here, that uh, the, the persons in charge of implementation are also trained on uh, and are done so in a comprehensive uh, manner. Thank you. And congratulations on an excellent, excellent uh, webinar. Well, thank you very much for your kind words, Mrs. Monhut, and I, you, you confirmed also the, the importance of, of training, so I suppose it's a... It's an important dimension that needs to be borne in mind for the, for the future. With that, unfortunately, as I said, we are already beyond schedule, but uh, I would like to thank very warmly our two panelists. I must say they are great experts, and it's good to, to have an opportunity to exchange with you uh, from distance through the video. And I, I, as I said, I think it gave to all of us much food for thought. Concluding on the international scene, as I said, we now we look forward to the next steps that will be taken within the framework of the United Nations and the, the date of September that you mentioned, uh, Mrs. Van Hoot, and, a, and on the side of the Council of Europe, um, I would like to reiterate our willingness to, to work together with you, with the European Union, um, with actors in civil society, uh, human rights defenders, their organizations like Amnesty International. I think that all together we can certainly do a lot to improve the, the situation on the global level. With that, I will now give the floor to Hans-Jörg Behrens, representing the German chairmanship to, to make some concluding remarks. Hans-Jörg, very good to see you on the screen, and with great pleasure I give you the floor. Thank you, Christoph, um, and thank you all, all participants. Um, well, at the end of the seminar, I, um, I will just make some short concluding remarks. And first of all, uh, there's a lot of thanks due to um, not only um, to our speakers, but also to those who have um, worked on the recommendation. Um, I will start with thanks to all our our uh, speakers, first of all, Rabbi Kufla, the Secretary General uh, of the Council of Europe and the Secretary General of Amnesty International. Um, 
And of course, then our moderators, Christa Oynun and Christoph Borel, who have uh, done a great job uh, in um, moderating the panels. All the panelists for their contributions, which have given me a lot to think about in this, in this important topic. Um, and all the participants who have joined in, in, in this webinar. Um, and then, of course, the, the recommendation. There has been a lot of work going into that, and mostly, of course, from Michael Crowley, who, who I, we all owe special thanks in, in, this, um, in this topic, and the rapporteurs of the Council of Europe, which were Nicola Wenzel and Chanaka Vikramasinghe, who is uh, now in the UN and certainly following the topic. Um, well, when we are, when we are talking about um, prevention of torture and the death penalty, um, we are talking about the the very essence of of human rights. This this is something that lies at the at the heart of all of our work and our mission, and whatever role we are um, we are here. Um, and what what I would like to highlight from this webinar is that this is a striking example of uh, international cooperation at its best um, and and on on several levels um, it's cooperation at the level of of the member states of different uh, international organizations um, intergovernmental cooperation in the Council of Europe um, most important as you know. Um, to get all member states on track of a coherent policy. Um, transfers were mentioned uh, as one of one of the areas where this this is most important. It's also a striking example of cooperation between international organizations, EU, Council of Europe, um, United Nations, other regional organizations. They all have to, to play their part and the way the cooperation has been going is, is really encouraging. Um, then cooperation with civil society, um, indispensable always, but especially so in, in this area where uh, much expertise and, and much um, knowledge about developments comes from civil societies and um, international organizations would be lost without this expertise. So many thanks um, to those who are working in this field in civil society, but also in, in private businesses. Uh, the, my impression is that the importance of human rights in a private business is um, more and more acknowledged. Um, it's a process, but it's a process that's going in the right direction. And that's one of the um, things that we have learned in recent years, uh, human rights and business is a, is a huge um, topic with many facets. And one of those is what we are working at now. Um, so what are the, the messages that we can take home from this webinar? What are the tasks set for all the actors? Um, well, for the member states, it's, of course, um, as has been said, to review their regulations, to make sure that they're in line with the recommendations um, of the Council of Europe, that they're in line with the EU regulations where applicable. Um, it's a duty to raise awareness with government officials, to, to make use of the existing expertise, for example, in arms trade, as was mentioned, um, but also to to make sure that there are no um, no loopholes between those who are acting on um, licensing and those who are actually doing controls um, to promote awareness in society in general to promote awareness um, in the business um, and to connect with all the actors. Um, the, the tasks for the international organizations are also um, to connect 
to uh, to reach out to civil society to make use of the expertise um, to reach out to private business to make sure that those who are uh, the um, the producers of, of of goods that may be misused do not um, do things that are incompatible with the regulations and recommendations and to promote the further and, and hopefully global um, regulation of, of this issue. And for civil society, it's, it's the task to um, to put um, to, to keep this on the agenda and to keep up the the pressure on on all the processes to make sure that they are going on. I, I believe that we are on a, on a good track there, not only in this topic but in human rights and business in general. But it needs pushing all the time, and it needs civil society to help us with that. With that, I would like to thank you all. In the name of the German Presidency of the Council of Europe's Committee of Ministers, and um, I am sure we will meet again to talk about this not only in five years' time when we have the review, but hopefully before that. Um, I can assure you that we will keep the topic on the agenda, and um, I encourage all of you to do the same. Thank you so much. Thank you. Very much, Hans Jörg. I must say, um, we in the Council of Europe are really delighted that Germany has paid so much attention to human rights in the context of its chairmanship. It confirmed the, the very strong commitment of Germany um, in this field, which for us is a, was very good, very encouraging. And I, I'm sure we can continue to count on the support of Germany once your chairmanship is over at the end of this week. Thank you very much also, Hans Jörg, for having give us this, given to us this comprehensive photo of a, what is on the table for the different actors involved. Um, a lot has to be done together, as you said, and uh, we hope that today's webinar was a one step, even a small step in this collective endeavor um, and we look forward to the next steps like you. We are willing to contribute to the next steps. And perhaps just to say at the end of the webinar that uh, um, all the proceedings of today's event have been recorded. They will be soon made available on the internet. So I hope that uh, if you are interested, you, you will have the possibility to go back to, the, to listen to the proceedings and perhaps also disseminate them. Mm -hmm to other people who may be interested in, a, in your different organizations in your country. So we would only encourage you to, 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 to disseminate the information. And since my colleague Alfonso de Salas is, 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 is drawing my attention to the publication of the recommendation, it is also available on our website. So please make as much use as you, you wish to, to make with the publication. And, uh, it is available, as I said, on our website. With that, warm thanks again to all participants. And uh, we found it a, a very extremely exercise like you all. <laughs> Many thanks again, in particular, to the speakers and the moderators. And see you next time, I hope. Thank you very much. <laughs>